We're back to Authors Corner on the Total Education Network, TotalTutor.net for more information. Twitter, Total Tutor, Neil S. Haley, Facebook. And we're promoting the West Hollywood Book Fair, and I am so excited to welcome the program. Celebrity, Marriott Hartley, author of Breaking the Silence. Marriott, thanks for calling. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking the time tonight to talk to me. I'm out in the East Coast, so it's a lot earlier for you than me. But yeah, uh, where? Uh, gosh, it's late for you. Yeah, so where? Where are you? Let's see, four one two area yeah. code. Where is that? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is our flagship station, and we're syndicated in about a hundred plus stations. And we're really excited to talk to you tonight about the book, Breaking the Silence. Uh, oh, thank you, so, Pennsylvania. Well, that's yeah. my old alma mater. Carnegie used to be called Carnegie Tech. Now it's Carnegie Mellon. But that's I went to. That's so funny, Mary. Guess what? Uh, I br- I started my radio career, uh, just starting my radio show and an education show at WRCT Studios. So oh, how funny! Sake. Isn't that isn't that a coincidence? Really, That's really great. interesting. That's great. Interesting story. I'll have to tweet that out tonight. Uh, so <laughs> basically, Mary, why did you decide to write the book? I mean, because this is something that is a very, very to kind of open your closet of your family and your life to do this is is, is a really. Uh, it takes a lot of courage in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, um, I've come an awfully long way um, about kind of revealing myself to other people. I mean, and a, a lot of that has been, it's just taken time for me. I come from Connecticut, and people don't talk about family. They don't, they don't you know, they don't talk about family secrets. I mean, it's all very, very hush-hush. And I have come to believe after years of therapy and, you know, support groups and stuff that uh, we are we really are as sick as our secrets. And, and gradually, gradually kind of... Um, walked out of the darkness uh, into into the light and in that process began realizing that my story telling my story to other people and having that story witnessed is extraordinarily healing for me and can be for other people and that's true for all of us you know we it's like all of us sitting around the campfire and sharing and there is such such healing and such recovery in in those circles um, circles of friends. So I, when Putnam asked me to write the book, I was right in the middle of you know a major career. That was when the Polaroid commercials had you know really come out and blossomed and become hugely successful. And and I was doing the morning program, and I don't even know how somebody knew my history because the the really dark part of my history had been kept secret uh for years and years because my mother had kind of sworn me to secrecy and um it wasn't really until i did uh, a movie of the week called silence of the heart which was about uh, teenage suicide that i began talking about it to other survivors i had no idea that there were other people who had survived the kind of thing that I survived at the age of 23, you know, when my dad took his life. Um, I just had no idea that anybody else had really gone through that. Um, so uh, I was, I, I, in that experience, that movie of the week, and, and I saw the response that people had to it uh, and that we had literally saved lives through it, um, because, you know, I mean, part of the reason for that was that I was a um, real stickler about, re- you know, realism. I didn't want it to look like a romantic story, a romantic issue at all. It was brutal and a horrendous experience to go through. And no one should look at it saying, oh, my, does not look nice. I think I'm going to, tr-. you know, it, I wanted none of yes, that. Yes, absolutely. So, but that's how I got involved with other survivors, and that was gradually then uh, the book began to, you know, percolate, and uh, Putnam, uh, I got a a book uh, agent, an extraordinary book agent, and they brought me to Putnam, and uh, I was interviewed by Neil Nyron, who was one of the editors, and uh, when I began telling my story, no, nobody had known it, and they were kind of in a state of shock about it and said, absolutely, we want this 
we want the book. And when I said that I wanted my best friend, who was an exquisite playwright, and kind of our family's Boswell to write it with me, uh, they balked. And I said, no, no, I won't do it I, oh. I won't, unless unless she unless she writes it with me because she's a fabulous writer. And and that's how it was born. And uh, it's had an extraordinary life. Uh, you know, these kind of book fairs I adore uh, because I get a chance to talk about it and to talk about the journey and, and then sign the books and make a little bit of money. I don't make much money, but it's it's still a very, very exciting thing to to meet people and to meet other survivors. Basically, that's a lot of that is what happens in these book fairs. So um, it's it's been an exciting journey, you know, from total silence and being a recluse uh, with with my secrets to being a spokesperson for uh, you know suicide prevention and erasing the stigma of suicide. Um, I mean, it, it that that you know coming full circle has been an extraordinary uh, transformative journey for me, and that's really what I I wanted to share in the book. And also, but the book also has a huge amount of humor, family history humor, yes. and uh, that kind of thing. So uh, I've gotten a tremendous response. As a matter of fact. I don't know if you've read Anne Serling's book about her dad, uh, Rod Serling, but Rod was a, I was a huge fan of his, and he was an amazing man in my life also. I mean, he hired me to do one of the great Twilight Zones. And when I read her book, I thought, I've got to, I've got to call this woman. I have to call her and tell her the story about her dad and how he and I met. And since then, she and I have been, uh, you know, corresponding via the internet. It's been an amazing experience. Oh, and she, she read the book and was just so, so, I don't know, she was so moving uh, about what she thought of it. And, and of course, I about her. So it's uh, brought sisters uh, into my life, you know, Eastern sisters. So it's nice. That's fantastic. Uh, and let's kind of delve into specifically enough. So you said, first of all, you wanted to write the book a lot earlier, and it's been a process where you've been wanting to and wanting to, then finally it's happened, and now you're yeah. getting to share. When you said attending these book fairs and getting to talk to people who have gone through a loved one committing suicide, I yeah. think that it's just something where you could be that person for the – I guess a shoulder to cry on in a lot of ways and also kind of uh, be that strong person to help them through this. Well, it's, it's interesting because, um, I, I run groups now. I run groups with a friend of mine who's a therapist and, and we do eight week groups through an organization here called DD Hirsch. And then I co-founded an organization that, 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 you know, the main um, uh, kind of um, base of it is in New York City. It's called the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So I kind of became um, a spokesperson for uh, for prevention. Um, now I, I watch the, my groups, and it's fascinating because... When one has had the kind of experience, I've had three suicides in my family. So oh my. when when you when you have lived through that battle, that war that you never asked for ever. I mean, it you know it's like a group. It's an organization of people who never wanted to join a group like this ever. And now that we have uh, the the power that we have in numbers. And knowledge and education has been extraordinary. And um, there are all kinds of offshoots of the AFSP and, of course, Dee Dee Hirsch and people who've gone through the groups become activists. Uh, we have a big walk on the 22nd of September out here. Uh, but there are international, uh, there are national walks, and you can look that up. People who are listening can look it up uh, it's called the American Foundation of Suicide Pre- for Suicide Pre- Prevention AFSP dot uh, org, I think it is, and you can see where all of the walks are and when they are, Lovely. and it's ama- and it, it it is so deeply helpful to know mostly in this kind of a loss or any loss, but particularly in this loss that you're not alone, that uh, if someone has actually. Uh, 
probably experienced exactly the same thing. And we actually, uh, in, at Dee Dee Hirsch, we have someone who, if someone calls in and says, you know, I've lost my child and this is how they did it, you know, we will immediately put them in touch with somebody who has lost a child that way. And it's, it's, it's a deeply spiritual movement. It has to be for us. Uh, we all volunteer. None of us get paid unless they're therapists. And I'm, I'm basically a, a facilitator. But people get such strength from sitting in those. It's like a 12-step meeting, you know. Uh, they've been through exactly the same things. And, and we know the journey through the minefields of this of these acts and, you know, the trigger points and the experiences with PTSD, which none of us knew anything about when, when yes. my dad died. So it's, it's been a, a growing, learning, enriching, transformative experience for me. And I, I feel very, very grateful and blessed that I can, that I, that I have gotten to that place in my life where it's, it's become a gift and, you know, the whole journey has become a gift. Um, I don't, I'm sure that there are plenty of people who aren't there yet, you know, yes. but uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's a very special, very special experience to see people grow and to see literally, the, you know, the scales fall from their eyes and, and to see the light kind of coming through and to see that, oh, this could have some meaning in my life, and I can continue to live past it. Um, and a lot of that is simply because they look at us. Absolutely. And, and we're not, we're, you know, we're, we're alive and well and, and living a, a very eclectic, wonderful life for the most part, and we've all experienced this in our history. Um, yes. So it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Oh, uh, absolutely. It seems like it's an amazing uh, situation. Do you ever think of starting a foundation, especially with all the work you're doing? Did you raise oh, I, I, it was what I said I did. The AFSP uh, uh, is oh, a foundation. It, yeah, so is that is that yours or not? No. Well, we co- I co- helped co-found it. Co-found. Okay. Uh, and I was, I was the um, spokesperson for it for years. Uh, now we have probably close to 60 chapters all over the country. Oh, so, and yeah. So it's become, unfortunately, on one layer, you know, on one level, and fortunately, uh, a very a powerful organization and foundation. So, uh, uh, Definitely. Uh, what, what do you think causes people to commit suicide? What do you think are the triggers in certain ways? You talked about one involving being, uh, again, in the military and, and going through some really stressful things. But what other things do you think? Well, I'm going to say one thing because you're in the public eye, and one of the things we're trying to shift is for people not to say committed suicide because uh, it, it has a connotation of being a crime. And, you know, if you commit a crime, and we, we I don't feel uh, in, on any level uh, religiously, spiritually, um, in any way, it's a crime. However, um, the pain that people feel in order to perform whatever act it is they perform in order to end their own lives is so excruciating, and it must be so horrendous for them to think that this is the only way that they can end the pain. And and I really have come to believe with my years, because I started working with survivors in 1985, um, and that, that this is one of the great reasons. The other is that it's often, um, you know, married to a, a deep mental illness. Um, and the only thing that I can say about that is, Nowadays, uh, you know, in the decade of the brain and all of the in- extraordinary medications that, that uh, have been created for this very reason, um, they, there's, no, there's no reason for people not to be on medication except for their own sense of, I can do this myself, I should be able to stand on my own two feet, um, you know, the way so many people feel. And uh, I... I come from a long line of people who are bipolar. Oh, wow. 
Mm-hmm. And I've had to look at that in myself and uh, in uh, another member of my family. And um, we've really had to look at it seriously and have had to, uh, you know, look at the medication. And the only thing I can say to people who are resisting it is to beg them not to. Okay. And to go to a psychopharmacologist and to tell them their symptoms. Uh, uh, there's nothing more frightening than, than having no answer. Oh, yeah. But there are answers out there now. And if that medication doesn't work, stay with a doctor and, and get the right kind of medication. Um, I mean, you can really save your own life that way or save someone else's life that way. It's, uh, I mean, that, that's real. That's, exactly. that's true. Yeah. So, but the military really frightens me. I mean, we're losing more people to suicide than we are on on the field, and I, I'm not. Well, I mean, I, you know, I'm in touch with veterans and and veterans organizations, and my heart bleeds. I, I don't know, I don't know all of the reasons for it. I really don't. Having experienced my own trauma, I know that I was never prepared for that. Exactly. And I don't think that many of these kids are ever, no. ever prepared for what they see. And oh, it, 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 we, I actually had, had a terrific kid in our group who's, who is a survivor. He lost his brother. brother. And um, there is a military family. And... I just hope that he really can work his way through it. You know, one of the things that we're fighting for now is parity. Yes. Um, with, uh, you know, insurance companies that they will really take mental illness seriously. I agree. Um, and, yeah, and that, well, I mean, I go through this with, uh-huh. with my daughter. It's how the, the, they, they just, they just really get you where the hair is short okay. and it's so unfair and so unjust and, the, these are people who desperately need help, and the insurance companies, uh, you know, just uh, tie their hands. They definitely and, do. And yeah. uh, and we're going to take a break, and we'll get back and, and finish up the to talk a little bit about some of the, again, parts of your memoir that are not involving something that's your passion, but also so things also things we're going to learn about in, in your memoir. So when we get back, more of Marriott Hartley. You're listening to Author's Corner, and we'll be back in just a moment. We're back to Author's Corner with Marriott Hartley, author of Breaking the Silence. And when I'm hearing this story, I'm hearing what's going on. I mean, again, you're you're a very powerful woman and and an empowering woman in so many ways to go out there and and dedicate your life to help people in this this process. When you talked about mental illness and you talked about specifically that's one of the causes of suicide and that we're not, we don't have the right treatment. We first will medicate people, but yet we won't let them go talk to somebody. You know, we'll we'll give a doctor can go prescribe the meds, but we're not going to know. What should we be looking for? What's happening? What would you tell those people out there right now, especially listening that, you know, are involved in the healthcare field and really look at how we can treat mental illness better? Oh, wow. So you're, you're opening up such a huge can. I, uh, you know, when I was realizing that there was something definitely um, happening in my body that was not, something was going on. Uh, and I was on tour and I was, um, living in a very tall building, and one night I looked out uh, at uh, the window and said, oh, wow, I mean, just jumping out of this window would not, it's not who would miss me, but how do I get away from this pain? And um, thank God in my life I had experienced it, and it was something I knew. My, my kids' faces flashed in front of me, and I said, oh, my God, I cannot put them through this. I cannot put them through what what I went through, and uh, I think somebody called me in that instant, and I ended up with a psychiatrist in New York, and because I was crying, I, I was in the midst of a divorce, a terrible divorce, and the father of my children, and uh, it was pretty devastating, and I sat there, and I cried, and I, the thing that I I remember about it is that he never really got a full family history. So I was prescribed um, something for depression. Right. 
Well, uh, Prozac or Zoloft or any of those things are extremely dangerous if you're even minimally bipolar. Oh, yeah. And your brain freezes. And I thank God I had been sober for quite a while, and my, my body responded instantaneously, and I knew that both of these medications were wrong for me. Now, kids in high school, and we lose a lot of kids because of this. Yes, we do. Um, don't get it. They don't know. And they're gone before we get a chance to um, regulate their medication. Um, but they need to know this. And doctors need to know this, that it's extremely Extremely, that, that bipolar disorder, we've got to find a way yes. of diagnosing it faster and more uh, solidly. I was finally diagnosed by being given the right medication, and suddenly my whole being oh. lifted. But that took a year. Oh, my gosh. And, and that's a long time. Um, and uh, now I'm fine. I mean, uh, uh, it's a happy ending. Um, yes. But I'm I'm able to um, I I'm able to see it pretty fast. And people say, well, what is bipolar disorder? Blah blah blah. It's any number of things. Uh, road rage can be a perfect example of it. Um, um, high sexual activity can be the incapacity to say no, um, um, allowing ourselves to. Um, be abused, uh, uh, curiously enough, can, can, if you read, um, uh, Karen, uh, Redfield Jameson's book, um, An Unquiet Mind, she's the one that really first, as a, as a medical person, came out about the other, the real shadow sides of female bipolar disorder. And, the sexual activities and what goes on, and it had never occurred to me that that's what. Oh my God! That, that that could be by so it's important to read about it, to look it up, to try not to be afraid, to try it on, to 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 say the words, and to get help instantly. Get help um, because this can be. I don't know. You know, people use the word sobriety. But the word sober, the root of the word sober is balance. And I think that, um, you know, so many people, oh, we, we use these words, but self-medicate. And it, they think that alcohol works and drugs work. My husband and I are absolutely addicted now to Breaking Bad. As a matter of fact, that's what I was watching when you called, when I called you back, when you called. Um, we're, we're just, and I, it's just such an amazing series. But you watch people... Uh, trying to find an answer that way, yes. and and it's impossible. I mean, it works for a while. You go into a kind of euphoria, I guess, but then it stops working. Then it becomes the problem. Whereas the psycho psychotropic drugs, you know, that really are for let's say, for example, for bipolar disorder, um, uh, the ones that uh, that help with. Um, um, a kind of epileptic brain, brain seizures is basically what they call it. Your brain seizes. Um, those are those are amazing. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, there's no, I have no desire to, to overdose on any of those. No, I know my exact amount. I know exactly what I'm, and my life is. Oh my God! I mean, there is such a difference in being able to kind of sit back now and respond to something, yes. as opposed to instantaneously react, oh my which is which is often a, a symptom. There are all kinds of symptoms, and I just wish that people would stay open about it, stay teachable, yes. don't close down, don't think of it as stigma, don't think of it themselves as being crazy and. Uh, alone with this because they aren't. Oh my! I, and and I was definitely these questions. I'm I'm learning so much from you, Mariette. Here's one question for you: uh, If you know a loved one that is suffering from some sort of 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 depression, anxiety, panic attacks, what do you recommend you should do? I mean, especially if they're not open to medication. They try to treat it naturally, and yet they're still really suffering inside. Uh, do they like to read? Yeah, they, they like to read. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I would definitely recommend that book, uh, uh, 
K. Redfield Jameson's book, any of her books. Um, my book is an easy book to read, but the, but the interesting thing about my book is that it's basically my story as a child to um, being raised in you know a behavioristic family. My grandfather was a famous psychologist. There was no touching, there was no talking really. I mean, it. So it's it's a it's a a, a kid raised in a certain era. I don't really. I've got another book in me that I'm trying to write, and that is what you and I are talking about now, which is how do you you know how do you how do you spot it? What do you what do you yes. do about it? I I'm a great believer in intervention. Um, um, you know, if, if there's a way that this person can stay open, can stay willing, uh, can take the first step that people take in an AA or an Al-Anon, which is, you know, I am powerless over this feeling that I am feeling. My life has become unmanageable. What do I do? And if I don't know the answer or my loved ones don't know the answer, I I'm sure that there will be somebody who will know the answer and can help. And I beg somebody not to be resistant to medication. Well, so I was terribly resistant to medication. Yes. I was sober. People kept saying, well, if you, if you take this medication, you're not sober. And my sobriety was very, very oh important to me. And yes. I, I've been sober almost 25 years now. Congratulations. Eh? Thanks. But I'm, 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 you know, I had to do it this way. And uh, and what they even say in programs, various programs, uh, because they're all anonymous, is that underneath the whatever the addiction seems to be, there are underlying causes. Yes. And and we must pay attention to them. We cannot minimize them. Right. Uh, Oh, wow. Well, I, I appreciate all the advice. I appreciate learning so much about this, especially my listeners out there. They really, and being able to open up your entire life to us in a way of the difficulties, but yet you oh. overcame them and you ended up so. Well, I began and, accepting them. I mean, it, it, I don't it, know if it's even overcoming them. It's, uh, you don't exactly. always have to like what you accept. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, but if you just finally look at yourself in the mirror and say, oi, 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 I'm in trouble here, um, yes. and get down on my knees and say, uh, okay, God, somebody, whatever it is, this higher power, guide me, please, towards yes. something and, and help. But that's the great prayer, you know, in the whole world is help. Um, and it, it's, as far as I know, it's always happened. So um, I certainly hope that this person in your life uh, can be reached. Um, also, listen, there, the book is, 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 as I said to you, it's very, very funny. It's, it's not all bleak. And, no. about, and a lot of that is about my career, which I'm very self-deprecating about, and, uh, except for the Polaroid commercials. I mean, they were just gold for me. And, uh, but there's funniness in every chapter, and uh, I hope people enjoy it. I really do. They can get it, you know, on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I'm trying to make it into a, an ebook too. So, um, thank you so much for this. This is great. Oh, I, I really enjoyed it, and love to have you back on the show again. So I'll make sure I can reach out to you in a specific way. Uh, if I'm, we'll figure it out. Email you uh, the link to the interviews when it airs, all on syndication and stuff, and stay in touch because, and and definitely have my loved one contact you. I really think oh, that, I think. oh it, it, absolutely they can write me it's marriottheartley.com or I think the other one is Marriott Hart or yeah I mean you and I can talk about that I I I talk to people I mean I will I will make a phone call so anything to connect and hopefully um be able to intervene in a positive way. Um, you know, I don't have any answers, yes. but I could certainly share experience, strength, and hope. So. Okay. Well, thanks for calling. And, uh, and, right. again, and again, you'll be at the West Hollywood Book Fair on September 29th. I think that's what it says, the, the, the yeah, date. That's the what... date. And, uh, uh-huh. and I'm sure you're excited about that and you love the book fairs. I am. Fairs. I am. Yes. I am. And I'm going to be in, in Lone Pine, can you believe that, on Columbus Day weekend. Oh, wow. Uh, my, my first movie, Ride the High Country, is going to be shown there. And uh, Leonard, what's his last name? He's a 
pretty well known critic. Mal- yes. Malty, yeah. Ma- yeah. Well, anyway. Malty, yeah. He's go- yeah, he's going to be there um, doing a panel. And Joel McRae's grandson, who I've come to really adore, his name is Wyatt, and we're going to all be there answering questions and stuff like that. And it's a, it, I don't know if you've ever seen Ride the High Country, but it's one of the great films of, of all time. And it's, it's Peckinpah's first really wonderful film. So that's going to be exciting, too. So if anybody's in that area, too, just come on by the Lone Pine Festival on the Columbus Day weekend. The Ride the High Country is being shown on Friday night. All right. Well, fantastic. It was, it was a delight. I'm glad I caught you and tried calling the second time because I know you were enjoying <laughs> watching the show, but thank, uh, watching your show with your husband. But thanks for taking the time to come on my show. Bless your heart. Thank you so much. All right. Take care now. Okay. okay bye. Bye-bye. You're listening to Author's Corner, and we'll be back in just a moment.